come to the end of the series, Remembering the First Exodus. And in this session, we will see how the Most High delivered his people from their captivity with a mighty hand, just like he said. The power of their oppressor was destroyed when the last plague dealt a final blow to the Egyptians and forced them to let the children of Israel go. So let's do a quick recap. We know that after the death of Joseph and the other patriarchs, there arose a new Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph and he brought the children of Israel into bondage. If you'll remember, Joseph made life comfortable for his brethren in Egypt. He gave them the best land and he made sure their needs were met. But Egypt wasn't supposed to be their final destination. Yah had already planned to make of them a great nation where in the promised land. So something had to cause them to want to leave Egypt. But Pharaoh's plan was to keep them in the land as servants forever. Sounds familiar? So when the people cried out because of the oppression, the Most High sent Moses to lead them out of captivity, but not before he unleashed severe plagues on the Egyptians. So let's look at the nine plagues we've talked about thus far. We saw the first one was that water turned to blood. Then they had frogs, lice, flies, the dead livestock, boils afflicted the Egyptians. They had thunder, hail, and fire, a plague of locusts, and a plague of darkness. Now let's go on. All right, let's look at this final plague, and we're looking at Exodus 11, 1 through 3. And we see that the Most High tells Moses that he's going to bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. And then he says, afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. So he tells him to speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. Notice that he does not tell them why they are supposed to ask for these things. However, this is a lesson for us. They were supposed to obey. Now think about those who were reluctant to ask for these things, or maybe they only asked one neighbor compared to those who asked several neighbors. They didn't realize that they were asking for these things because it would serve as their payment for the centuries of serving Egypt without pay. So sometimes the why is not going to be spelled out for us. We need to learn how to obey the command that has been given. Let's go on in verse 3. The Most High gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. It says, moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt and in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. All right, now we're looking at Exodus 11, 4 through 8, and Moses is telling Pharaoh what the Most High has said concerning this last plague. So he's telling him that the Most High said he would go out at midnight into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt would die. We're talking the firstborn of Pharaoh, the firstborn of the female servants who served or who sat behind the hand mill and all the firstborn of the animals. And this is significant, you all, because the birthright and inheritance went to the firstborn. And he's telling Pharaoh, there will be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again. But listen, again, he's making the distinction. He says, against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue against man or beast. And why was this happening? 
so that Pharaoh would know that the Most High was making a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Now, the other thing that I want to say is that some may ask if the firstborn included women of those who were going to die. If you read Exodus 13, 12 and Psalms, 78:51. it would lead us to believe that it's talking about the males here but notice he said none of the children of israel would be harmed again the most high's purpose for doing this was to make the distinction between the egyptians and israel now listen to what moses says to pharaoh in verse 8 all your servants will come down to me and bow down to me saying get out and all the people who follow you moses is telling him pharaoh your people will come and bow down to me and tell me and the people of israel to get out and he says after that i will go out then he went out from pharaoh in great anger of course, we know that Pharaoh's heart was still hardened, so he didn't listen to Moses. He did not agree to let the people go. But the Most High had already spoken to Moses and told him, Pharaoh will not heed you so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did what the Most High had told them to do. The Most High hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people go. But even his rebellion served a purpose. It was so that the wonders of the Most High could be multiplied in Egypt. Let's keep going. Now the Most High continues to speak to Aaron and Moses and we're looking at Exodus 12, 1 through 5, and he's telling them that the month that they were being delivered from bondage would be the beginning of months for Israel. It's our new year. The first month of the year for us is called the month of Abib, which is usually in March or April. So he says to them, speak to all the congregation of Israel and tell them, on the 10th of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Now listen, he's telling them this lamb is to be without blemish, a male of the first year. Now, if you remember, this was the same thing said of Messiah. He is the lamb that was slain. He was without spot or blemish. So he says, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Continuing on with Exodus 12, 6 through 11, they were also told that they needed to keep this lamb until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel was to kill it at twilight. And you're making the connection now to Messiah's death. And they were to take some of the blood and put it on the two, on the two doorposts and on the lentil of the houses where they eat it. They were to eat all of the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread. With unleavened bread. So now we see the two feasts here, Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is how Passover came to be, you all. They were supposed to eat the flesh of the lamb and the unleavened bread with bitter herbs. And he told them, don't eat it raw, don't boil it at all. It had to be roasted with its head, with its legs and its entrails. He says, let none of it remain until morning and what remains of it until morning, you are to burn it with fire. He says, this is the way you're supposed to eat it with a belt on your waist 
your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. You're supposed to eat it in haste. He says, this is the Lord's Passover. Yah's Passover. This feast was to always be remembered and kept because it was to serve as the memorial of our ancestors' deliverance out of Egypt. But the Roman Catholic Church changed this into Easter. And now you have folks more concerned about the Easter bunny and Easter eggs. The importance of Pasach was lost to us. Pasach, Passover. But do you see why this was not an important event for Christians? They had not been enslaved in Egypt. This feast held no relevance for them. But do you see how things have come full circle? Do you think the day when we leave here will also be etched in our memory so much so that it will serve as a memorial for us? Let's keep going. All right, let's look at Exodus 12, 12 through 13. Now Moses is telling the people what the Most High had told him and what he had just told Pharaoh, that the Most High was going to pass through the land of Egypt and strike all the firstborn of the Egyptians, both man and beast. And don't miss this. He says, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Do you see his plan unfolding here? He was also coming against all the gods Egypt held dear. So he's telling them, this is the reason why you need to put this blood on the houses where you are, because the blood would be a sign. The blood served as a sign. He says, when I see the blood, I will pass over. Feast of Passover. I will pass over you and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Let's look at verses 14 through 17 and we'll see that the Most High told them that this was to be a memorial for us and we were supposed to keep it throughout our generations. It was to be a feast by an everlasting ordinance. Now, what's an ordinance? It's a decree. Who make decrees? Kings. So for seven days, you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. And on the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation for you. So let's look at this word convocation. What's a convocation? Let's look at that and we'll come back to this. Let's take a look at this word convocation. This is from Bible Hub and we're looking at Easton's Bible Dictionary. It says a meeting of a religious character as distinguished from congregation, which was more general, dealing with political and legal matters. Hence, it is called an holy convocation. Such convocations were Sabbaths. Don't miss this point because the Gentiles made it seem like a Sabbath was just the seventh day, as in Saturday, some would say, if you want to look at it, just to use an example. However, they were all Sabbaths because they were all holy days. What are we talking about? The Passover, Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. These were holy convocations called Sabbaths, plural with the S. So here's the key point. 
they translated all of these feast days as Sabbaths and say, oh, well, you don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore, including these feast days. Why is this important? Let's go back to the passage and that will explain it. Let's look at verse 16. It says, on the first day there shall be a holy convocation and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. So you see two Sabbaths within one week. There were two Sabbaths or holy convocations during the week of Messiah's death. Gentiles made a serious error in not understanding the significance of these feast days, or maybe it was deliberate, but it led to the false doctrine about Easter and how Messiah died at noon on a Friday and got up on Easter Sunday morning. That is not three days and three nights. So people are forced to act like they don't know how to count in order to make it work. So I covered this in a video called Easter Sunday Myths. Check that video out if you want to know more about this. Let's read the rest of this. It says, so you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on the same day, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. We were supposed to observe this feast throughout our generations. Messiah and the disciples did. Let's take a look at that. This comes from Matthew 26, 17. Now on the first day of the feast of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Yeshua saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? So how is it that there is no longer the mention of the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover in Christian theology? It's because the Gentiles got a hold of our books and made their own insertions. Is there any wonder why the oracles were not given to them? All right, continuing on with Exodus 12, 21 through 28. Now we see Moses calling for the elders of Israel and he's telling them, giving them all of this information, giving them the specific instructions about what was supposed to happen with this Passover lamb and telling them they needed to take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that was in the basin and then strike the lintel and the two door posts with the blood that was in the basin. And he told them, Make sure none of you go out of the door of your house until morning. Now, this, this is important here because it's important to take note of the fact that the Most High had made a distinction between Israel and Egypt, but now obedience is required for this plague to bypass Israel. The other plagues, that were wiping out a lot of the Egyptians, their livestock, the boils, um, the darkness, etc., had not touched Goshen. But in order for them to be spared from this plague, they had to obey. They had to obey the commands that were given. It says, it will come to pass when you come into the land the land that the Most High will give you, just as he promised, that you shall keep this service. And it shall be when your children say to you, what do you mean by the service? That we were supposed to say, or our ancestors were supposed to say, it is the Passover sacrifice of Yah who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians and delivered our household. Do we know about this today? As I said, no, because Christianity has completely removed this and inserted the Easter tradition. So when the people heard this, they bowed their heads and worship. 
and then they went away and they did what had been commanded to them now again obedience was required for this but you can see how the most high had been preparing them beforehand to obey this command let's keep going here we see Exodus 12, 29 through 30, that it's now midnight and the Most High is moving through the land. All the firstborn in the land of Egypt fell under this plague. It struck all the firstborn in the land, the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So it says, Pharaoh got up in the night with his servants and all the Egyptian. And it says, there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Can you imagine what this was like for the Egyptians? Every house suffered loss, every house. So Pharaoh calls for Moses and Aaron by night and he's saying, look, rise, go, go out from among my people, both you and the children of Israel. Go, go serve your God as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said. Be gone. And look at what else he says. Bless me also. Not only Pharaoh, the Egyptians urged the people that they may send them out of the land in haste, like get out of here. They said, for we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, which is why it's called Feast of Unleavened Bread, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. It says the children of Israel had done according to the word of Moses and had asked from the Egyptians articles of silver, gold, and clothing. And the Most High gave them favor, so much so that the Egyptians gave them what they asked for. So it says they plundered the Egyptians. They gave them what they asked for. And the same thing will happen again. We will be paid. Let me show you something. This is Deuteronomy 24, 14 through 15. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, whether one of your brethren or one of the aliens who is in your land within your gates. Each day you shall give him his wages and not let the sun go down on it. For he is poor and has set his heart on it, lest he cry out against you to Yah and it be sin to you. Now, it is quite possible some theologians prefer the New Testament over the Old Testament and they didn't read this. So let's look at another one from the New Testament. This is James 5, 4. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the most high look are you going to tell me that religious leaders during slavery didn't see this it is a sin for a believer not to pay wages that are owed so are you going to tell me that christians and evangelicals don't know this verse Shouldn't they be the main ones fighting for reparations for us? You would think. But do you see our scriptural reference for what is owed to us that it has to be repaid? Based on these two scriptures, we have to receive recompense for the unpaid labor. Let me show you something else. This prophecy from Isaiah 64 through 5 is concerning the land and the people of Israel. Lift up your eyes all around and see, they all gather together, they come to you. Your son shall come from afar and your daughter shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy because 
the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you the wealth of the gentiles shall come to you that's not all let's keep going it goes on to say in verse 9 surely the coastland shall wait for me and the ships of tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar what are they bringing with them don't miss this their silver and their gold with them what did they bring out of egypt silver and gold <laughs> let's keep going now let's go back to the story this is exodus 12 37 through 42 to see how it all ends for the children of israel after they were thrown out of the land of egypt after that tenth plague it says they journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides children. A mixed multitude went up with them also. Now, this mixed multitude would include those who were living in the land of Egypt, witnessing everything that had happened and decided to join themselves to the children of Israel. It goes on to say, and the flocks and herds a great deal of livestock went out with them and they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they had brought out of egypt for it was not leavened because they were driven out of egypt and could not wait nor had they prepared provisions for themselves so it talks about the sojourn of the children of Egypt, us children of Israel who lived in Egypt. It says it was 430 years. And please take note of that for those who say the 400 year prophecy was only referring to this first captivity in Egypt. It says it was 430 years and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years on that very same day it came to pass that all the armies they were considered to be the armies of the most high went out from the land of egypt it is a night of solemn observance to the most high for bringing them out of the land of egypt this is that night of the most high a solemn observance for all the children of israel throughout their generations now i will end it here but i do encourage you to continue reading so that you can see that pharaoh hardened his heart once again and ultimately his army chased Israel into the sea and the Most High caused the waters to close in over them. But in the last session, I mentioned that there would be a pivot for Egypt. And I did want to cover this before ending the series. I'm reading from the Septuagint and this is Isaiah 19, 11 through 15. And it says, and the princes of Tanis and Tanis is the city, an Egyptian city also known as Zoan. It says, shall be fools. As for the king's wise counselors, their counsel shall be turned into folly. How will you say to the king, we are sons of wise men, sons of ancient kings? Where are now thy wise men? And let them declare to thee and say, what has the Lord of hosts purposed upon Egypt? The princes of Tanis have failed and the princes of Memphis are lifted up with pride, and they shall cause Egypt to wander by tribes. For the Lord has prepared for them a spirit of error, and they have caused Egypt to err in all their works, as one staggers who is drunken and vomits also. And there shall be no work, to the Egyptians, which shall make head or tail or beginning or end. Now, I have two images here because I want you to remember 
that Egypt was taken over by colonizers as well. The picture on the top is what the original Egyptians looked like. The picture on the bottom is showing how Egyptians are represented today. These are not the same people. Just like there are those pretending to be us, the same thing happened to them. So let's see what else the Most High says about Egypt. All right, continuing on with verses 16 through 25. But in that day, the Egyptians shall be as women in fear and in trembling because of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shall bring upon them. And the land of the Judeans, Judah, shall be for a terror to the Egyptians, whosoever shall name it to them. They shall fear because of the counsel which the Lord of hosts has purposed concerning it. In that day, there shall be five cities in Egypt speaking the language of Canaan and swearing by the name of the Lord of hosts. One city shall be called the city of Asadek. This is talking about Assyria. In that day, there shall be an altar to the Lord in the land of the Egyptians and a pillar to the Lord by its border. And it shall be for a sign to the Lord forever in the land of Egypt. For they shall presently cry to the Lord by reason of them that afflict them. So they reaped what they had sown. What they did to us happened to them. And he shall send them a man who shall save them. He shall judge and save them and the Lord shall be known to the Egyptians. And the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day and they shall offer sacrifices and shall vow vows to the Lord and pay them. And the Lord shall smite the Egyptians with a stroke and shall completely heal them and they shall return to the Lord and he shall hear them and thoroughly, thoroughly heal them. In that day, there shall be a way from Egypt to the Assyrians and the Assyrians shall enter into Egypt and the Egyptians shall go to the Assyrians and the Egyptians shall serve the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be third with the Egyptians and the Assyrians, blessed in the land which the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be my people that is in Egypt and that is among the Assyrians and Israel, mine inheritance. You all, just like Egypt had to reap, America will reap what it has sown. The crimes committed against our people did not go unnoticed by the Most High. But it's amazing how European colonizers seem to think they can commit such crimes against humanity and just get away with it. Just sweep it under the rug and pretend that it didn't happen. We should all just get along now. So I want to look at this article from Fortune and they're looking at a research that was done to answer the question as to why white middle class Americans are dying at an alarming rate. Let's look at this. So these two Princeton professors are asking if it's economic malaise that's killing off middle-aged white Americans, particularly those without a college degree. And this is another thing about this nation. They always deflect to something else without addressing the real issues. We can tell you what's going on. You are entering into the beginning phases of your judgment. So they blame the deaths on despair, like deaths from alcohol or drug poisoning, suicide, liver disease. They say these things have risen dramatically for whites. But it says now the scholars have updated their research linking economic despair and social dysfunction to the underlying factors. Let's go on. 
So it says now to be abundantly clear here, it's not that whites are suddenly worse off than blacks and Latinos in the economy. Far from it. So that's not the real problem. It says on average, blacks and Latinos have lower household incomes and higher unemployment rates than whites. And broadly speaking, blacks still suffer from a significantly higher mortality rate than whites. So it says the authors are not disputing those things. But what the authors are trying to figure out is why are mortality rates rising for middle-aged whites, whereas they're improving for nearly every other group. Now imagine that. So they're asking, what's the cause then? So it says the researchers don't pinpoint any one reason, but they seem to have ruled out geography and gender as factors. You all, again, we can tell you what's going on, but you don't, you don't believe us. So let's go on. What the reports now show is that deaths related to drugs, alcohol, and suicide increase for whites at all education levels between 1999 and 2015, but were most pronounced for those with merely a high school education or less. So why are whites increasingly engaging in these behaviors? Well, it says the authors don't have one definitive answer, but they believe the story is rooted in the labor market. Now, you all, how could it be in the labor market if they already said they are not being economically disadvantaged and those who are, are not experiencing these same things. Let's go on. I want to look at something else. This comes from another article in BBC News. And it says, are America's whites really dying faster? It says white female drug deaths in the United States. And you can see the map. You can see the change just over five years. It says, although death rates for white Americans are lower than for minorities overall, why some groups of white Americans should be increasingly prone to those unhealthy behaviors remains a mystery. On average, African Americans are poorer and have less access to health care than white Americans, and yet their death rates are not going up. So the author says, it's hard for me to accept the fact that these things which are actually lower for whites are accounting for their increase in death rates. And apparently recent reports are showing that the CV event that we just had has made it even worse because this report from Harvard School of Public Health is showing that the CV death rate is now higher for them than for us. We can simply point to scripture and tell them what's happening, but they won't believe it. They would rather point to other imaginary reasons because they hold themselves blameless for their crimes against us. Egypt was never the same after the Exodus, but they did manage to survive. But things will not turn out the same for this nation. America is going to be destroyed. It's Mystery Babylon. If you remember in the last session, I read the verse that said the Most High would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed because this nation will not humble itself and repent. And that's not to say that individuals within the nation won't. Again, just like with Rahab, but reprobates refuse to acknowledge truth. But just like with Pharaoh, this nation will drink from the cup of Yah's wrath. You're going to see a dearth of white men in this nation. They will be scarce 
and white women who are looking for eligible white men to marry will find themselves accepting any man they can find. Their parents will be sorely disappointed by this, but deep down, they will know that their daughters won't have a choice. And this is going to, going to be the repayment for how America purposely destroyed black families. They left black women with little options as a result of the assault against our people because of mass incarceration, the government placing drugs in our communities, inciting murders and riots, the effeminization tactics used, and other strategies that make it difficult to foster healthy black families. These things will affect what we call common white folk in the beginning, but it will soon spread throughout the land. Israel, just know that the Most High sees us. He sees the needs of his people. He has seen our tears and heard the cries. But you have to remember that all things are working together for our good because we were chosen by him, which means we are called according to his purposes. Do you believe that, Israel? Do you believe that he's doing a work just like he did with our ancestors? They didn't know that they were going to be made into an army and a nation in Egypt. What was meant to break them made them stronger. And as we get stronger, our oppressors get weaker. They are getting weaker, even though they are in league with the kingdom of darkness, believing that their power is greater than the most highs. But he is going to deliver us with a mighty hand and force them to bow. So as we bring this series to an end, I encourage you to be at rest, family. Yah is working to bring about his plans and his purposes in the earth and in us. Has he said it and will he not do it? We know that he's faithful to himself and he's always faithful to his word. So we have to continue to stand. Yes, it's hard to stand, but our father will not leave us and he won't forsake his people. He is bringing about the good that he spoke of. So we have to stand on what has been spoken and remember that his word won't return to him void. So trust the process. Trust Yah. Trust his love that's never ending. He knows who belongs to him. And as I said, the good, bad, and the ugly are working together for good. Believe it and trust Abba Yah. Sing hallelujah because he's faithful. So I hope this series has been a blessing to you. Be sure to share it with someone. Don't forget to hit the like and you're welcome to subscribe if you've not already done so. Join me next time. Shalom, everyone.